strengthening earth. Again, I'll ask just for a little more volume from upstairs, and I would like to again reiterate how happy we are to have the scouts with us on today. We are proud of our scouts who have marched both 2008 and 2012, and when Troop 358 is out, Grace Baptist Church is out. They represent us, and we are proud of them. I want to say to Brother Kellum, um, he looks so young. He looks so, it looks like a baby, actually. I, I thought he was at 18 years old. Come to find out he's actually older than Brian Wallace was when Brian started at Scout Max. Brian started at 24. So Brother Kevin is at least over 24 years old. He must have some good genes in his family. <laughs> oh. and, and, and Brother White, in my sermon today, let me ask this one. Is there a merit badge in finance? <laughs> Everybody don't get a merit badge in finance after today's sermon. You make sure they get <laughs> I want to reiterate it, and I thank uh, Reverend Junction. He didn't get correct the way he should have, but that's all right. It's the 13th and 14th of the not the 12th. So somebody look up the 12th for me and tell me what it is. Yeah. Reverend Junction, I give you permission to correct me on that one. That, 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 that's, too, that's too much rich history. To this is the 13th that abolish slavery. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you even for the cold weather. We thank you that you provided us with homes that were warm and safe from the elements outside. And we pray for those that were not as blessed as we were. Some way, somehow, you would touch men and women to open up their hearts and their arms to those that are in need. We thank you, O oh God, that our coming today is not in vain, but that you will open our ears that we may hear, our hearts that we may receive. Then I pray, O oh God, that you would hide me, that even though we may talk in our sermon about money, that we would still hear Jesus speaking to us. Now come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty soul. This preaching hour coming in people blessing. Give your word success. Holy Spirit, let us now understand. Amen. Amen. I, you know, the weather did not work with me today. I just knew when we put out on the sign, money matters that the church was going to be packed out. <laughs> not necessarily with members of grace, but all of the people who I run into that tell me what I'm preaching who have never darkened the doors of Grace Baptist Church because they drive up and down Johnson Street and they pay attention to our sign. Money matters. The question is, do you believe that money matters with God? Did you realize that in Scripture that there are 800 Scriptures that deal with money? Jesus actually talked more about money than he talked about heaven or hell. Of the 39 parables that we have in the gospel, 11 talk about money. So I would like to suggest to you that money does matter. However, I must admit that when we talk about money in church, you, you, you know, we, we start cringing. Out. So some of us are cringing right now. We, we're so good at cringing that we can't see you cringing to get clothes with you, Christian. Because yeah. for some reason, we do not put money and God together. And when we talk about it, we know in church all they're going to talk about is giving. Give me your tithes and your offering. Well, let me just say what that is because it's not a bad thing. Your tithe, that is just giving one tenth of what you have earned back to God in the life of the church and the ministry. And, and it is in the Bible one of the greatest acts of obedience 
that you and I as Christians can practice. And, and there are some principles behind tithing that are far greater than the money. Oh, yeah. It has to do with your obedience to God. If you and I can tip someone in a restaurant mm -hmm. for their service, how much more can we give God the first tenth of what God has blessed us with? And notice that I say that it is the first tenth because tithing is not just any tenth, but what you're saying is, God, I put you first. And so what I bring in, I give you the first. I like to suggest, though, especially for you young people, listen to me, that the second tenth, put that away in savings. <laughs> Learn to live off of 80% or less of your income. Amen. The Bible has much to say about money. And when it comes to money, as I said, some of us get scared, but the truth be told, we get excited too. <laughs> Because when you talk about money, the first thing comes out of mind is how much you're going to give me. So we begin to think of how much can I get instead of how much can I give. So the purpose of this sermon, the meaning of our text that was read today, is that money does matter. The parable that was read, I preached from that parable before, and I spiritualized the parable as most of us in the church do. But the reality is when you look at the text, the text called it Bags of Gold. King James Version would call it talents. Another version would call it talents of money. This parable comes in very powerfully in Matthew's Gospel. It, it comes right after Jesus talks about the second coming in the 24th chapter. Then over in chapter 25, the why is so readily prepared us because before we get to the story of the talents, we hear the story of the bridegroom who's arriving yeah. at night. Yeah. So you heard the why is saying, keep your lamps trimmed. Yeah. Because that is the reference of that song right there in Matthew 25. And then at the end, it talks about money. Scary thought. I did not know that money can have some spiritual dimensions to it. That my faith and money can actually go together. Now this is a sermon that's a hard sermon. So for all of those that like to say amen, I need you today. <laughs> because most folks are not going to say amen preaching about money. And I think it's such a good sermon that I might preach it again. <laughs> but we've all been guilty looking at scriptures in the Bible, we spiritualize it. But sometimes we forget the practical aspect of it. So I just want to talk about seven stewardships of, uh, principles that we see in this text. And it is my prayer that after this, that every scout sitting here will go in and earn the finance merit badge because you would have gotten a prelude to it in today's message. First, I want to say what we have is not ours. you got to remember, what you and I have is not ours. Verse 14 continues to say that uh, he called his servants and entrusted his property to them. It, it was common for wealthy men when they would take long journeys to, to delegate the control of their wealth for the multiplication of it to their trustworthy employees. That they were expected to actually bring a return on what had been handed over to them. God owns everything. God is sovereign. God has the right to do what God wants to do with God's possession. We sing the song, God has everything and everything belongs to him. But, but we need to be reminded of what Job said. Job said, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is the owner. You and I are nothing but stewards. God gives us the responsibility of being a good steward. So money and faith are connected because money does matter. Second, 
We are given what we can handle. Look at verse 15. To one he gave five talents of money, and to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to their ability, and then he went on his journey. And we need to pause here in order to recognize that this word talent has a different understanding than what we understand in present day. A talent, according to this text, is a measure of weight. A talent actually indicates a large sum of money. It, it, in this case, it was gold, but it could also be copper or silver. And so while commentators may differ on the exact amount of what it is, it really was the minimum of 20 years of work. Now, if we were to use the minimum wage and put that into 20 years, we're talking about at least $300,000 that they were given for each talent. And I know that in our secondary way of looking at this text, and I preached it this way, we talk about the gifts and graces that we have been blessed with, the ability to sing, to play, to do service unto God. But that's not what this text says. This text says that the master gave the first servant five talents of money, which is about $1.5 million. Then the second he gave two talents which is about 600,000. And to the third, he gave one time, 300,000. Even though there's a big difference now between what each one of them gave, you have to admit, God, or well, this is the case, the master, was very generous to each one of them. And so wherever you are in life, you need to count your blessings. God has been very generous to you. Don't look at your neighbor and see that they got five and you got two. You still have more than enough to be a good steward of what God has given you. Because the text really lets us know God gives to eat according to what they can have. But our job is to be faithful with whatever amount we have been given. And what it says, do we trust that God knows what God is doing? That God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. Third, we must invest in what we have been given. Verse 16 tells us that the servant who received time, five times says he went at once and he put his money to work and he gained five more. He didn't waste any time, but the text says immediately he went to work. I, we don't know what his investment portfolio strategy was, but we know that when the master returned, he had gained five more. The second servant did likewise. He said he went at once with his two. But verse 18 stands out. Because here we have this one talent servant. What did he do? He went off and dug a hole and put his master's money in the ground. Even though we do not read in the text any specific instructions on what to do, it seems that the two servants up front knew what to do immediately to multiply their investment. But this one talent servant, I like to call him a slacker. Because he went off and he buried his blessing. Now, let's try to put that in today's vernacular. Do you your money wisely Amen. or foolishly. Now I'm preaching to the young people, but I invite all you older ones to listen to me. Do you waste or do you invest? And when I say invest, I'm not talking about Wall Street. But what I am suggesting, are you a good steward of your possession? Let me put it this way. When you get paid, do you think about God first and give him 10%? Do you listen to what the preacher say? And this is not just the preacher. I'm telling you right now, if you talk to any financial plan, they will tell you to at least put 10% aside for your retirement savings. Are you investing or are you wasting? Do you get to pay your bills on time? Don't say amen. Don't say amen. Oh, uh, you're behind. Just think about this. Just think, sir. This, this is a thinking 
Yes, sir. Yes, it is. Did you make sure everybody gets out? Are you making good use of your resources? What What do you say? Do you wait for the sale? Yeah. Yes, Because you know it's going to get cut at price the same item. Are you living within your means? Or are you doing opposite? Then the opposite, in this case, I don't mean waste. Are you sporting? Are you being stingy with what God has given you? The text suggested how well we manage our possessions. Read over the text. Will determine our reward and glory. Now, that's a scary thought. If you afford and marry your gift, don't expect any reward to be given. Last Sunday, we talked about some tests that we take. And I like to suggest, I just like to suggest, that how we handle our blessing will determine our rewards. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about your reward in heaven. But how you handle what you have right now will determine your future later in life. Fourthly, there is a day of accountability that is coming. Verse 19 says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled their accounts with him. While most of us believe that this story is really about what did you just use with your gift, let's look at the practical side. Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves before God. I'm only suggesting to you just to be faithful with what God has given you. Now, I know the question is coming. First, the question is coming. Why is the preacher talking about money? I want to know if there's another question at you. Why is Jesus talking about money? Maybe it has something to do with our faith. When God is in complete control, when God has your heart, your mind, your soul, and your body, then God has everything. You and I, we sing this song, I'm the old song. Everything I got, everything I have, everything I got, and then we don't give nothing to God. I mean, something like that. The song says, and this is the song, try me now and see. See if I can completely be yours. Come on, preach out. But the irony of God gave us permission to try him. Because mm -hmm. in Malachi, he says, try me. Yes. Put me to the test and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that you won't even have room enough to receive. And, and, and the scary part of what I'm preaching today, I might not be here next month because people don't like to preach about this stuff. Mm -hmm. They say, Greg, you're getting up in my business now. My money is my money. No. God is the one that gives you the power to give up. God is the one that gives you the strength to go to work every day. You, you, you need to earn on your own. You need to thank God for what God has given you. And the thing what God is saying is when you give, He gives more back to you. Because you can't be God given. What we do with what we have actually reveals our view of God. Look there at verses 20 to 25. Look at the language that the, the first servant comes back and says, See, I have gained five more. Did this word see actually could be interpreted a whole or look? He was eager. He was excited in what he did. He couldn't wait to present what he had done because he wanted to please his master. Man with the two talents approached for his time of reckoning. He came with the same anticipation and excitement. The master is thrilled with both because they have demonstrated a word called responsibility. He says the exact 
same thing to both of them. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. The master now increases their resources after they have proven their faithfulness. Really what the master was saying to them is, I affirm you. Because I affirm you, I'm going to promote you. And I'm also going to celebrate you. The phrase, well done, can actually be translated as excellent or wonderful. They were faithful. And God says to them, I'm going to reward you because they knew that God was a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. They had a good view of God. Likewise, God is looking for faithful people. For those of us who will properly manage our resources for kingdom purposes. And when we're responsible like that, when we give, you know what God does? He gives more to us. Because we can handle what we've already been assigned. He said, I can give you more. Now, now you can have more responsibility. Let me make it personal. If I gave any one of you five thousand, you brought me back ten. I'm gonna let you keep the ten and see what else you can bring me back. If you did that, just think, God says, look what they've done. I'm going to give them more. But look at this third servant over there, verse 24. Had a poor view of the master. He said, I knew that you was a hard man. Now, I don't know if you really pay attention to words in the text. Sometimes, you know, we can read the Bible for years and miss things. But notice what the third one started with. He said, I knew. Mm -hmm. The first two said, Master, you entrusted me. Have you put God first? Mm -hmm. The problem with the third servant is that he had put himself on the throne. Mm -hmm. This third servant had a wrong view of the master, and his mind was made up even before he received something from the master. He looked at the master as someone who was hard and harsh instead of loving and gracious. What we think about God is very important. Some of you may be secretly angry with God because you think that you didn't deserve this and why did God do that? And as a result, sometimes our views of God become skewed. Your preconceived notions prevent you from seeing God as a God of grace, a God of love, and a God of mercy. And when we blame God, we end up burying our blessings. We end up burying all that God has invested in us because we view God as harsh and mean. A faulty view of God leads to excuses. His fear, his third servant, paralyzed him. And so what he decided to do is, I'm going to play it safe. So he hid the money to make sure it would not be lost. Now, I want to say to anybody that knows who had no money, <laughs> you're going to forget where you put it. <laughs> Don't go out of your backyard, Mary, no more. Put some money down, it may not be there when you go back. But what I would like to say about this man, and it really says that if you're aiming for nothing, you'll hit it every time. He said, I'm not going to do anything, and guess what? He didn't get anything. A wrong view of God always will lead you to fear. He says to his servant, I was afraid, and I went out and I hid the talent in the ground. But a right view of God will always lead you to faith. And if you're struggling with fear today, the best antidote of fear is to really get a better understanding of who God is. Yeah. And when you come to Bible study, did I say that? <laughs> and learn more about, when you read your Bible and learn more about God and what God will do, you'll find out, and I have some people that will jump right now and testify that they said, when I did this, God opened up. I didn't expect it, I didn't know, but God <laughs> did God's word. Hey! And when you prove that God will keep showing you himself more and more, and you say, you know what, I hear the God of okay. this. Yeah. I honestly believe the first two servants were a little fearful themselves. 
but they had the right view about God. Amen. They knew God was not a man that he would lie. Yeah. Neither was he the son of man that he had to repent. Yeah. If God says it, yeah. God yeah. will surely bring it to pass. Yeah. Yeah. Sixth one, what we have, we must use or we will lose. Mm -hmm. Verse 26. Oh my God, I didn't know that Jesus would be so strong with his words. He called the third servant, you wicked, lazy servant. In other words, the master is saying, you're lying. In your heart, you are just selfish and lazy. If you really wanted to do something, you would have invested my money. But I can see right through you. These are some pretty strong words here. But God will judge us not merely for what we do wrong, but sometimes what we avoid to do right. The man was wicked because he deliberately misrepresented both his master and himself. He falsely accused his master of being harsh. And he lied when he said, see, here is what belongs to you. Oh, uh y'all -oh, didn't catch that. I, I didn't catch that for the oh, oh. He actually did not just owe his master what belonged to him, but he owed his master what would have been the return if he had invested in what belonged to him. And amazingly, instead of owning his own guilt, he behaves as if it's the master's fault. <laughs> as if the master's at all. We, we all have an element now of laziness, so let's not just beat this third guy up. Yeah. 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 So I'm convinced that laziness is extremely dangerous. It's dangerous to our spiritual lives as well as our practical lives. When we think that we can put something off until later, we will eventually discover that later is too late. <laughs> Proverbs 6 9 says, How long will you lie that you slept? When will you get up from your sleep? Then Proverbs 10 5 says, He who gathers crops in the summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps during the harvest is disgraceful. Now the practical point, young people, that I'm trying to make is that the average American, and I'm guilty of this, is not prepared for retirement. They're not sufficient. You know, ironically, I, my boys got here last night, we went to eat, and I went to the hotel room, and I had on my favorite Susie Morgan until Calvin turned to chat. <laughs> but I saw just enough. I don't know who the woman was. I hope she's not in this audience today. <laughs> Calls Susie Orman and says, I want to retire in 10 years. I still owe 174000 on my house. I got 98000 in my retirement. I bring in about 4400 a month and I spend four, I mean four, yeah, 4400 a month. And I spend about 4000 of it out. Can I retire in 10 years? And she said, I know this is a bad, I, I think I deserve a D. You know what Susie always said? I give you an F minus. <laughs> You're not ready to retire. <laughs> you got a mortgage that, oh, you are not ready to retire. You have to invest in your future. Before I make my final point here, Another story I want to share, and I, and I hate that there's not more people here, but I experience, I like sharing real life experiences too. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 13, 22, that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. I put a note here, don't forget your church either, though. <laughs> but leave something from the church as well as the family. But I remember working in Newark when I first graduated from undergrad, and there was a co-worker there. She didn't know God, apparently. Or at least she didn't know this scripture. She said, I can't leave nothing for my children. I earned my life to get yours too. I'm a, and it didn't sit right. I didn't even really know the scripture the way I did now. That don't sound right. The Bible says to us that we should leave an inheritance for our children. And that's a wrong way for anyone to think.
that you are going to live off of everything and not bless your children and your children's children. How do you think other groups of people are prospering today because they are standing upon the shoulders of their forebears? No, we may not have a lot, but we can leave something for our children and our grandchildren and our great children that their future can be brighter than ours. Look at our African American fathers and mothers who built colleges that we have attended today. The sad part is that most of us can't even maintain the colleges that they built right after slavery. And they made nothing in comparison to what we made. They left an inheritance for their children. We have that responsibility. My final point is who you know and what you know will lead you either to abundance or to agony in the future. Verse 29 says, For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Those who have given themselves over to full surrender to God will be given more. But on the other hand, those who bury their blessings will have to face agony. Jesus concludes this parable by saying, you worthless servant, I'm going to throw you outside into darkness that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What are you saying, preacher? A lack of faithful stewardship, according to this text, defines you as worthless. As you take personal inventory, and I know this has been a sermon that has caused many of us to think. Do you want abundance in your future? Or do you want agony? All I'm saying is invest in what God has given you. Invest in the kingdom of God. Invest in your personal savior and live within your means. I could have said all of this in this closing illustration. Let me share this illustration with you, and I can't just paint the picture. There are some people who are in so much debt, young people, that they are like a person carrying multiple boxes, trying to go up on the escalator that's coming down. Now, sometimes y'all say, y'all do this, you're on the escalator. It, it is coming down and you try to keep running up, but you're going against the grain, you know what I'm talking about? But this is a person that's carrying one, can't even see the boxes is so much, the debt is so high. And they're trying to go forward and up on a down escalator. But then there's a second group, and most of us, thank God, in this group, but we need to move out of it. We are trying to make headway, but we are nothing but on a stationary trail. <clears throat> we pay our bills on time. We meet all the needs. But we're not getting ahead because we're just making the time. <laughs> and you ain't going nowhere. I, I, I go to the gym. I love the treadmill. I do a whole hour on the treadmill. <laughs> I still got to stop. See what I'm saying? You ain't making no headway. I'm watching the TV going 3.2, 3.5. Got a little sweat. Get on the scale, ain't lost nothing. <laughs> but that's how some of us handle our finances. We are just getting by. But this sermon was really to encourage you today that you need to invest so much in your future, mm -hmm. so much in what God has given you. And please know that the talent that God has given you, your gifts that God has given you, will bring wealth into your life. If you have a bubbly personality, know that that's a gift from God that God will use to bring into your life His blessings. And all I'm trying to say is you need to move from the stationary treadmill and you need to get on something called the moving walkway. The moving walkway you see it in the airport. You know what the moving walkway is? That most of us are not there yet? I mean, maybe one or two of the deacons are there because you know, they're looking at me like, I don't know what you're here to go. That's when your money works for you even when you ain't doing nothing yourself. Because on the moving walkway, you can walk, and you just move there a little faster, or you can stand still and get where you go. And that's when 
you know that you have invested stuff, that even when you sleep in bed, your money is still making money for you. Beloved, God's word is practical. I, I would love to preach a sermon every Sunday and talk about heaven and preach you into a friend's room. But sometimes we need to hear God tell us things that help us with our living lives every day. Money doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter about your view of God. Money doesn't matter when it comes to your faith. And when you believe God and put God first, God says, when you give me 10, and you learn to live off that 90%, and the preacher's saying, live off 80%, save he says, what I will do for you will meet every need in your life and I will open up the windows of heaven and you will find out I have more with the 90 than I had if I had buried the Lord. As we all stand and open the doors of the church, I invite some young man or some young woman. As we say trust and obey. You may say, this preacher didn't preach about heaven or hell at all. But he preached about something that's going to help me live. If Jesus would even tarry and allow me to stay on earth for another 50, 60 years, God has spoken to me through his word to say, This is what I can do to become a better Christian and a better man.